Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of it, sells, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. If you don't know who this guy is, and I do because I have followed his career for decades. I actually had the opportunity to see this gentleman perform, I want to say about 1985, 1986, at the Santa Barbara County Bowl. He was with the Pat Metheny Group. He had been with the Pat Metheny Group since 1983, uh, played with them to about 2001, won seven Grammy Awards, uh, along with multiple music magazine polls and received several gold albums. Played drums and percussions on David Bowie's hit recording, of course, with the Pat Metheny Group, This Is Not America. Performed in all 50 states and over 60 countries. And in addition to the Pat Metheny Group, he's also been on stage with the likes of Charlie Hayden, Scott Earl Holman, Larry Coriel, Paul Winter, and Kurt Ellig, just to name a few. He's also played drums and percussion on hundreds of recordings, hosted his own weekly radio show, Paul Wardico's Wide World of Jazz from 2010 to 2012. He's an associate professor of jazz studies at Roosevelt University's Chicago College of Performing Arts. He's also the inventor of his signature product, Tubes, made by Promark, who also makes the Paul Wardico signature drumstick. And this is the part I love when I did my research. Paul's drumming has been compared to that of an impressionist painter. He's been called an inspired madman. Who hasn't? A restless innovator, a true legend of jazz drums, a master of drumming insanity, and a genius of the sticks. Paul, welcome to the show. Jeez, I don't know what to say after that. I guess it's going to be all downhill, you know? (laughs) No, it's not, because we're going to still talk about when you mentioned to me a couple of weeks ago in our in our phone call, you've actually driven a train. I guess that's how you say you've driven a train and you've flown a plane. You, you've done just about everything, haven't you? I guess I could go to my grave and feel like I had a good life. What can I say? I've been lucky. You've been very blessed. Uh, let's start back at the very beginning. As a kid. Did you know you wanted to be a drummer in your early days as a childhood, kind of developing and growing up? Or were you beating on pots and pans? Or were you playing other instruments? Or how did you come into this world of being a percussionist? Well, you know, I always liked music. And I was an only child. And no one in my family really, you know, was musical necessarily. And then when I was 12, my family and I moved to this place, Cary, Illinois. You know, it's a northwestern suburb of Chicago. And at one point, my mom said, you know, you should take up an instrument. Just don't take up the drums. <laughs> but I was always tapping on things. I mean, I really loved music. I loved playing along with records, you know, with pencils and stuff on the desk. And so I joined the school band when I in, in sixth grade. And, you know, it was a total natural thing. I mean, I had my, well, my band director, Vern Pate, was a saxophone uh, player and so he taught me how to hold the sticks and how to read music and everything and then I could just play it was weird I ended up being you know even though my schoolmates had been playing maybe since they were eight I could just play I could play I played a drum set of my friends before I had a drum set I could just play it and so I became like you know the the soloist in the band and then when I went to high school I got a graduation present of a drum set and my mom you know, I asked my mom, can I take a drum set, you know, some lessons? And she said, no, just keep doing what you're doing. Wow. She was basically just playing along with the radio, you know. And But I was always buying records, listening to things. And then my high school band director, who I wrote a book called Turn the Beat Around. I dedicated the book to him because, and we're still good friends to this day. His name's Donald Ehrensberger. You know, he 
really wanted me to be in the band. And so even though I was into chemistry and I was into like sports, I really wasn't thinking about like joining the band. He asked me to do it. Uh, there was an audition for the concert band. There were five chairs. I didn't even look at the material. I came in eighth. He expanded the percussion section to eight <laughs> chairs, you know. And then I was in, and he just he would let me improvise on, you know, symphonies. Say, I like what you do more than what's written. It's funny because just on Facebook, just recently, someone posted a picture of me playing with with the jazz band. And all these kids, they're adults now, but all these kids were talking about me. And it was so interesting to actually kind of read what they had to say. I mean, I, it was really heartwarming. And then today, I just put this up on Facebook, too. Someone posted the third gig I did with the Pat Metheny group when Pedro Asnar and I joined. It was at, at Montmartre in Copenhagen, Denmark. I can't believe it was recorded. It was like over three hours long. And I was like, going, oh, no, it's probably, you know, because we were still learning the music. But it's really good, you know. So it's kind of fun to revisit all these kind of things that are part of your life. And, you know, get far enough away from it not to judge it. But also, like, when you see people say nice things about you, it's like, wow, you know, that's, that's great to see, you know. When you first started getting serious about this uh, becoming a, a drummer and a percussionist did you think it was going to take you the places that it has taken you i mean uh, you know let's anybody that's in the jazz world either as a player or a fan such as myself i fell in love with pat metheny back in like 1977 did you have any idea that you'd be playing with these players or how did this all come about that's a great question. I mean, for one thing, I never consider myself a jazz player because I was playing so many different types of music. And I had this huge record collection of, you know, rock and jazz and ethnic music. So I just considered myself this drummer, you know, that just did what I did. I reacted to the music as I heard it, you know, rather than work on, you know, I, I was a voracious practicer too. But I never thought of like any. You know, if I did this and this and that, I'll get here. And I, mean, I never thought of, I never had a master plan. I just basically played and just tried to live a life that, you know, made decisions that I thought were the right decisions to make. And so I never really thought about getting anywhere, really, to be honest with you. And that's why, you know, in so many ways, I'm really blessed. I mean, I have no idea how I got where I am. I mean, I've been with my wife you know, for over 40 years, you know, I've been at Roosevelt going and going on 19 years. I was with Matheny for 18 years. I mean, most of my relationships are really long. And it's just, it, it, again, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, because people sometimes will go, oh, you know, if I do this, I do that, and I meet this person, I put myself in this position, I move to this city. And sometimes that works for people. But it's the same way I play. I don't really have a, a worked out thing when I play. You know, I don't go in and play beats that I practiced or anything like that. I, I listen to the music and it tells me what to do. And in some ways, I, I feel like life has told me what to do. I just kind of listen to it, you know, if that makes any sense. How did you hook up with Pat Metheny in the beginning? Well, it's so interesting because, you know, after I joined the high school band, we went, we were on like tour for a bunch of high schools and stuff. I was getting these standing ovations and we went to Western Illinois University and, and I got a full scholarship there. And after I left, then I kind of moved to Elgin, Illinois, and started playing with people in Elgin, this band Earwax Control. And then slowly but surely, as we broke into the Chicago scene, we were kind of hopscotch on each other. So the bass player, Jeff Check, would get a gig and say, oh, man, I got this drummer, you know, and I'd get a gig and I got this bass player. And so before I knew it, I was playing with everybody in Chicago. And so... The thing with Pat, I was playing with this guitar player, Ross Trout, who knew Pat. I think they might have been roommates in Miami. And I was, at that same time, I was also playing with this really legendary tenor player, Joe Daly. So he was like 63. I'm like, you know, 21 or something, 22. And at that time, I had been with him for about two years, and we were going to play the Jazz Showcase, which was, you know, that's like the Village Vanguard of Chicago. It's like, you know, the place to play. And that same weekend, Pat Metheny had called me to do a week with him. This is right after Watercolors came out. And I turned him down. Oh, wow. Yeah. I just said, man, you know, I said, I'd love to play with you. But, you know, I've been with Joe for two years. This is a big gig. 
you know, I had Muhal Richard Abrams, you know, one of the founders of the AACM and Steve Lespin on bass. And so I turned him down. And I think, you know, that was something that Pat always respected, you know, as we talked later on after I started playing with him, that, you know, the loyalty aspect of, of playing with someone. And then I went to see him play a couple times. And literally, I did not try to get that gig. You know, I love the music and everything. And, you know, I would say hi to him after a concert, maybe. But Steve Rodby, who I played with a lot, got the gig. And then Steve and I did these records with this band called the Simon and Bard Group. And so in 1982, it's very, you know, like December 1982, I was on the road with the Simon and Bard Group. And I was playing, we were in Portland, Oregon. Now, by, by this time, Steve was with Pat. So Pat and Steve came in after their show to hear us because they had a concert that night. And, you know, I just said hi, didn't think anything of it. And then Pat sounded me about, you know, a week or two later, because Nana Vasconcelos, the percussionist, had left, and they were going to audition a new percussionist. And so they hired, not hired, they just asked me if I would play drums for this guy's, you know, audition. And I said, sure. I thought, you know, you know we had been talking about playing together for a long time. And I figured I'd go out to Boston, and I'll just jam we played and the guys, the percussionist audition lasted about a half hour. And then we played for about, you know, 12 hours. We oh, started my playing. gosh. Yeah, it was crazy because I didn't know all that music. You know, I, even though I like Pat's music, I didn't have it memorized because I did not think of it as an audition. I just thought we were going to go jam. So at one point, you know, it was winter time. You know, we're Boston. It's snowing. And Pat goes, you know, go out in the hallway for a second you know we just want to talk so it's like so i'm in the hallway shivering you know <laughs> and i come back in and pat goes well hey man you know i'm going to be in chicago on new year's day you know why don't you learn some of the music you know maybe steve will you know you and steve can get together and we can jam again i thought okay great so we jammed on new year's day it was fun just the three of us and then about a week later pat said you know do you have a um you have a passport and i said no he said get one you're going to europe wow and so again just a total natural thing and i had to learn all that music then because there were no drum charts if i look at this gig in copenhagen it's over three hours long and i remember our very first gig which was in oslo because i had never been to europe you know we played in oslo and the gig was over three hours long and my snare drum broke the second tune oh my god snare strainer just broke right off so we had to duct tape the snare strainer and i had to play this three hour plus concert with a broken snare drum you know just imagine that and you have these famous jazz musicians from from you know norway like jan garbrick and jan christensen they're in the audience you know and here i'm playing <laughs> you know this new band trying to learn the music in this club you know jet lagged and like you know it was just it was like like, what do you do? But that's in life. That's that's the way, you know, that's the way you go. And so when I heard this stuff today, I was kind of expecting like, oh, no, I'm probably going to be missing a lot of cues and stuff. And actually, it's really good. You know, there's a couple loose moments, but nothing unmusical. And we were really playing hard. And I'm playing a snare drum that Pat actually bought me at a drum shop in Copenhagen that afternoon because my snare drum was shot. Isn't that crazy? It is. We're going to take a break, get a word in for one of our sponsors. We're going to come back. We're going to talk some more with Paul, not only about Pat Metheny, because that obviously is a big story, but so many other things that you have accomplished here. Hi, this is Miles Copeland, and you're listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook. 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. 
In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer, songwriter, performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer, songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio, Paul Wertico is with us this evening here on the business side of music. One of my favorite albums, and and I mentioned at the very beginning of the show, I, I saw the Pat Metheny group at the Santa Barbara County Bowl. I think it was 1985, 1986, somewhere around there. First Circle had just come out, and I was a big off-rap fan. Now, all of a sudden, here's this First Circle album that has all these different time signatures and melodies. And, and, and the very first song is this very uh, discordant, you know, marching band. You know, I think, yeah, Forward, Forward March, March, I think yeah. Lyle was playing trumpet and you, you were playing a field drum. And how did that album come to Because really, that album to me, kind of set the tone for a lot of the rest of the Pat Metheny group music. Well, that album, you know, that was the last album that Pat's group did on uh, ECM, the label. And so we really didn't have like a lot of time. That was recorded like in two days and, you know, very quickly recorded, very quickly mixed. Was that something that the record label just, they put that constraint on you or? No, it was just kind of, I think, budgetary. Yeah. Because the next record, Still Like Talking, I think we took like six months to record that because <laughs> all of a sudden we were on Geffen. So some of that, you know, it's it's the budget. It's, it's you know, it's sort of the material, you know, because the more time you have, sometimes the more time you spend, too. You right. Because we finished in six months for the, the six-month record, but we finished in a couple days on the couple days record. And first circle i just remember you know pat had written that in the synclavier because that's we were starting to do a lot of things you know with uh sequencers and i just remember you know there was the it's in 22 8 so we had a lot of working titles like for instance are you going with me was called fleetwood you know after fleetwood mac you know mick fleetwood kind of thing so 22 8 was the time signature and it was actually you know a bar of 12 8 and a bar of 10 8 and there's a pattern because whenever you play odd meters, you know, it's all twos and threes. So it's three, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, two. And so, you know, we clapped that out. But when I played, I didn't think, you know, I didn't think about counting like subdivisions. I just, for me, a lot of times I'll just sing a melody and it just happens to be in that time signature. And, and it's easy for me to do, you know. So we recorded that one, you know, we recorded I mean, Forward March was supposed to be, that was actually my title, Forward March, because I think someone else had put February March, but we ended up using Forward March. But that was just supposed to, we were supposed to sound like, you know, a really kind of just a young grade school marching band kind of thing. You know, and you pulled getting, it off quite well. Yeah, and that and that actually became, you know, like for a lot of our concerts, that became our first tune. A lot of times, you know, I would march and Peter, we'd march through the audience towards the stage. I mean, it was so much fun because it was such a loose thing that by the time we play the first song, which would either be phase dance in the earlier days or, or have you heard, you know, you're already warmed up, you know, you're already ready to go. Right. But it was, it was so much fun to do that. And like, I remember bringing home the rough mixes and playing first circle for my wife and she started crying. I mean, she couldn't believe how beautiful that song was. I still listen to it to this day and it's, it's, I think it's one of my top three favorites you know are you going with me and of course if i could which is also off the the first circle album i love i love Masaja though Masaja. yes yes that's like one of my favorite drum tracks too that song is so beautiful and the way it builds it's like what can i say so you continue to play with pat till about 2001 and you wanted to take some time to be with your family and you were traveling a lot i take it you were on the road constantly well yeah i mean you know so i'm not sure of the last gigs we played but i think things came out in 2001 but you know before i was married I could just go out and you know 
wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, you know, we were both living separate lives because she's a, a musician too. But once my daughter, you know, our daughter was born, it was a little different because I, I did not want to be one of those musicians that, you know, has a family but never sees them. Right. Re- I really didn't want to do that. And henceforth, I mean, our daughter's great. Never missed a birthday. I never missed like a first dance or first anything with her. So I can really feel like besides being a very fortunate musician, I feel like as a dad and as a husband, I did a good job. And that that's to me, that's a big part of, you know, why you even are who you are and, and how you play the way you play. And so it wasn't it wasn't an easy decision. But, you know, again, kind of following where to go when it's right. And it was the right time because, you know, Pat – we hadn't played in in a while, and Pat was already playing with different people, and so it was a natural kind of process. I just talked to Pat, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and my wife, who was in the Secret Story band, you know, we're still all friends, and we still all talk. But, you know, once I did that, I started becoming, you know, involved in, in education, because I always taught drum set lessons. When I was 15, I was teaching at, like, three music stores already. But to be in the educational, like, you know, in colleges and, and universities, I would do master classes and stuff, but I never had time to really take it and look at it as a full-time job. And now it's my full-time job, which I love doing that, too, you know, because you can be as creative and influential doing that as you can playing music. Do you think, and, and, and let me see how I can phrase this question of uh, the correct way, the Pat Metheny group, obviously, the the core players, you and Steve Rodby and, and Lyle Mays, God bless him, he's, he's since gone. And Pat, at that time when you were you were going in a different direction, do you think uh, PMG had pretty much run its course by then? Or you said Pat was starting to play with, with other players. Well, I don't know if it, it run its course, but like when I joined Pat's band, that first 83 tour, winter 83 spring, in Europe, you know, we played some big places, like we played Hammersmith Odeon, you know, in London. But then we played a lot of places where people didn't really know us. I mean, I remember playing Le Mans, France, where, you know, it was winter time, and we get to this kind of theater, and they didn't sell a lot of tickets. So the theater owner or you know, the club owner didn't even turn the heat on. So we played inside with our winter coats. Oh my you know? gosh, yeah. Yes. So it wasn't always that everyone knew who we were. And I'll tell you a funny story about that because, you know, when I first got the gig with Pat, if people asked me, you know, what do you do? I'm a musician. Who do you play with? Oh, Pat Metheny. Some people go, oh my God. Some people go, I don't know who that is. Right. So. On the David Bowie thing, after we got done recording This Is Not America, on the way back, we had been up for like 51 hours. We had been up like two days, you know, trying to finish this track. No drugs or anything either, but, you know, we had been <laughs> up. And and David got me and Steve uh, Rodby, like first class uh, t- seats on TWA on the way home. You know, we had wild boar on the flight and everything. So when we got in to O'Hare, you know, I'm going through customs. And, you know, there had never been a problem with customs usually with me, you know. So anyway, I get up to the customs in a person and he, and he goes, what do you do? I'm a musician, blah, blah, blah. He goes, oh, who do you play with? Now, instead of saying Pat Metheny and getting the, you know, who or whatever, I went, David Bowie. And he goes, who? I went, David Bowie. <laughs> I said, David Bowie. He goes, okay, put all your stuff over there. And they went through all oh, my, my stuff. Oh, my gosh. And so I learned that lesson. Sometimes it's better to be well known but not too well known you know yeah i hear you it's one of those lessons in life we're going to take a break get another word in for another one of our sponsors come back we're going to have some more discussion here with paul wordico hey this is amira alvarez founder and ceo of the unstoppable woman and i'm sitting here with my pal bob bender sharing my expertise and wisdom here on the business side of music stay tuned You're listening to the business side of music. Are you curious about Gordon Lightfoot's songwriting process or what it was like working with Prince in the 80s? Have you ever given any thought to what goes into a golf course design or writing a book? I'm Steve Waxman, the host of The Creationist, a podcast about people who create. Each episode features a different creator sharing stories that I hope will inspire your own creativity. The Creationist is available now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
Back in the studio, Paul Wardico is with us. I want to kind of take a sidebar for a minute here. I, one of the things I want to talk about, obviously, is the song that you and your wife, Barbara, did that wound up on uh, Deepak Chopra's Spotify playlist. But I want to talk about some other things that you have done, non-musically for a minute. You are a professor at Roosevelt University, and you're not teaching just music. You're teaching business, too? Yeah, well, I'm teaching music business. Which is a very important thing. Well, yeah. And I mean, you'd be surprised how many people don't know what they're getting into. You know, they practice, they've learned all their, you know, theory and everything. But a lot of them don't know once they graduate what to do. So, you know, I'll use like Don Passman's book, you know, everything you all you need to know about the music business, you know. And the whole idea is, you know, I'll make sure they have a website I'll make sure they know about, you know, copyright, especially if they're writing songs, right. you know. So it's just a one semester course. But I had one student who's older that had gone to another university that he graduated and they didn't have a music business course. And he went, oh, my God, you know, he graduated. He goes, now what am I going to do? He had no idea on how to market himself about, you know, branding you know, and, and especially about like, you know, if you're in a band, who owns the rights to the name, all these things that are so important because it is a business. And I also teach a lot of non-music students. So I've come up with like five courses. You know, I've come up with uh, social justice through sound. So that's talking all about like, you know, all the songs, you know, that had a lot to do, you know, with, you know, Pete Seeger and all that about, you know, helping workers and stuff. I'm teaching one right now, rock music, its role in society. I, t I taught one last semester, uh, The Power of Black American Music. I, I teach one, Exploring the Blues. And you'd be surprised how many students don't know anything about all this stuff. And so, you know, we'll study the artists and everything, but we'll also look at the music business. We'll look at the culture. We'll look at, it like, how it influenced it everything fashion speech you know i mean music is so important and I, even just saying that you know before sports integrated you know you had bands that were integrated you know yeah, like right benny goodman for instance you know he had his quartet he had two black musicians and two white musicians and that was way before jackie robinson or anything the importance of music can't really be you know overestimated really taking us a, a step back to the very beginning who influenced you musically maybe more than anybody well that's a great question i mean i'm not one to say you know like i don't have a favorite anything or anything like that but i think when i was younger just you know i listened to you know pop music on am like you know the hollies the beatles all that stuff and i would jam along with that but then, you know, the Buddy Riches, you know, Sandy Nelson. I don't know if you remember who Sandy Nelson is. You remember Sandy Nelson? I don't. Sandy Nelson was this drummer. And like starting around 1959, he had all these number one hits. He was a drummer. And it was a lot like surf kind of music, you know. So he had, you know, teen drums and all this stuff. And he was basically just kind of playing like old school, like Gene Krupa stuff, but with rock stuff. And he had many many albums out so i would buy that stuff and it, w it was really so that and then just listening i mean i i was into like i said both rock and jazz but i also listened to like ethnic music i listened to african music i listened to, to chilean music you know tibetan buddhist monks i listened to everything i could possibly listen to i love that you bring that up because i think in so many instances here in especially the united states we seem to get compartmentalized with music and we don't realize how global it is when i was uh when i was in high school i was listening to an african group called osibisa and i just loved the horns and the percussion and and it was unlike anything else i'd ever heard and i think that that's something that so many young people are missing today is that outreach of that global music that's out there. Yeah, I, I would have a tendency to, to agree for sure. And also, you know, kids just don't have the time to listen to stuff anymore, even though they have a lot more access to things. Everything goes by so fast and their attention spans for music. I mean, one of the scariest things for me when I was with Pat 
in the early days, we went after a gig, I think it was in Scandinavia somewhere. We went to some disco. We were invited somewhere for some drinks at a disco. And I walk into this place because I, I wasn't a disco kind of guy. And, you know, I'm seeing all these multi screens and everything. I'm like, wow. And they were playing like pop tunes. They'd play like, say, I can't get no satisfaction. But they would play like a minute of it. And then they'd go into another and they'd play a minute. And so I went and I asked the, the DJ guy, so you can't even play a full you know, two minute song. He goes, no, people, people lose interest in it. Wow. And that scared me because here we are playing 15 minute pieces, you know, and, and when you play jazz, the sax solo might be 15 minutes before right. the 10 minutes trumpet solo. So just the whole cultural aspect had changed for so many people. And so kids now, you know, they're used to hearing machines make the music a lot of times too you know everything's quantized and auto-tuned and it is kind of shocking when i play to my non-music major students you know i'll play like a Jimi hendrix cut if we're studying you know, like psychedelia and and like i'm i'm tearing up you know listening to this stuff and they go wow that's kind of weird sounding it's like oh my god you know like it just doesn't it doesn't speak to them the same way it might have spoke uh, spoke to us which is really sad Paul Wardico's drum quintet. You did a song called Cowboys and Africans. Right. I, it took me a while to find. I guess it was off your philosophy project. Absolutely yeah. love that. Is, is that kind of the, the territory that you're talking about? Because it's not the norm. Well, I've always, I mean, I've written a lot of songs, but even a lot of songs that I did not write, because that song was written by Jeff Check from Earwax Control, actually, but I morphed it into something. And then even like tunes, if you go listen to my trio, and we'll do a tune like 8 by 12 or Testament, you know, those were both written by Eric Hochberg, great bass player. And he like 8 by 12 was more like a blues. And I take it and I make it into this like sort of avant-garde or net kind of thing. So for me... In a way, as a band leader, because I produce a lot of records, too, I hear music. And so I find music that will work, and then I'll kind of twist it into my concept of what I want it to sound like. And usually musicians are really open for me to do that, you know, right. because it, it expands what they're thinking. Because if they're just writing something that's a standard blues or, you know, a standard, you know, AABA form or something, and I mess with it, they're going to be like, wow, we didn't even know that you could really do that. So then henceforth, a lot of times they'll end up doing that for themselves later down the road. That's the, that's the thing about influencing people as well as being influenced by people. If you could get together and play with anybody now that you haven't played with is is there somebody out there that you just oh man i'd love to get in a studio or get on stage and play with this cat or these cats no you know it's funny because i've been asked that before yeah i don't have like a you know a bucket list of anybody and you know in some ways pat always just used to say this about me too because i was really into rock i mean i loved you know, Cream and Hendrix and all, the, you know, The Who, Ginger Baker and, you know, Mitch Mitchell. And I would have loved to play like in a band like U2 or something, you know, just a band that really where you can just play a pocket and play great tunes and, and make make a lot of money. It yeah. would, have been, would have been fun because, you know, I've done fine. I, I have no complaints, but it would have been a trip. But, you know, that that's that's not what I pursued. I pursued what came naturally to me and I brought in those elements, you know, into the music that, that I started playing. And, and that's, that's the thing about life. You know, it's really hard to complain, you know, especially in today's world, when you look at, so, you know, even with COVID people say like, how are you doing, you know, this last you know year we're doing fine. I'm able to teach remotely. My daughter's able to work remotely. My wife's able to work remotely. We haven't gotten sick. You know, so we really, you know, you really feel terrible for the people that have lost work and, and, and lost loved ones and stuff. So, you know, no complaints here, you know. Non-musical question. We talked about this earlier in the show. Driving a train. I got, <laughs> I got to hear about that one. Well, there's a, there's a number of times on that. Well, for one thing, I love trains. You know, I've got a gigantic Lionel layout, like with 26 switches and, you know, like tons of books and videos. And so the first time I actually drove a train, I was with this Polish rock band, SBB. And we were on a day off, I think it was somewhere in Yugoslavia, which, you know, broke up. And so I don't remember which country is exactly was in. But on a day off, we went to this 
beautiful, like, you know, like sort of mountain monuments. And on the way coming back, you know, we were going to go back to the hotel in the city. We were, you know, an hour or two away from saw some railroad tracks. So I say, where are the tracks going? Oh, that goes back to the you know town we're going in. And as I said that, a train pulls in. So I, so I went like to, I had a drum tech, Polish drum tech, and and he spoke whatever language we were in. And I said, ask the guy, you know, the driver, if I can ride up front. And at first the guy said no. And then my my tech kind of explained who I was and who I was playing with. So the driver goes, okay. So the, my tech and I go go in the cab with with the driver. We're going through the mountains, and I'm talking, you know, through a translator, obviously, my tech. And after about 20 minutes, the driver, you know, the engineer, he looks at me because he knows I know a lot about trains. And he goes, <laughs> and he gives me the controls. And so for the whole rest of the time until we got to the town, this is in the mountains. I'm driving a passenger train. Oh I'm making the gosh. stops, you know, at the stations and everything. And then also later on, you know, I've met so many people that are fans and so when you know people in, in like the industry, not only the music industry, but even in the railroad industry, you know, so I've been able to get up, get up and at like a steel mill drive freight trains and all that. Stuff. I mean, it's just it's like one of those kind of things. And I always tell people this is it for, you know, especially in the music business. Don't be afraid to ask for anything. Right. Because the worst they can say is no. So, you know, I remember being up front in the TGV, you know, the fastest train, you know, in the world from France. I was sick one day after a gig and I'm on the platform and I see the cab is open. And, you know, I, I look at the driver who's French and I don't speak French. And I go like, me betterista, you know, better, like love trains, I like, look. So he lets me up there. And the next thing I know, we're going. And I'm not driving this train, but I'm up front with the driver. And this is actually after... This is after uh, 9-11, believe it or not. Yeah. And so, you know, and I've done that now with the ICE train in Germany. And I was on a speed train from Warsaw to Hungary one time in the cab. You know, I mean, I've been able to do that a lot. And there's something about railroads and musicians, but especially drummers, you know, because the whole clickety-clack of the rails and the whole dry, you know, the side rods of a steam engine, I mean, that's really where a lot of the, the rhythms come from so it's really interesting. And I, you can tell I'm passionate about this. You know, it's just one of my loves. And it's, it's such a such an honor and a privilege to be able to have the opportunity to do that. So I have to ask last train home with with Pat. How was that? I mean, you're basically laying the rhythm in there of a train going down the tracks. Yeah. And I mean, it's funny because that's, I think, the only tune that I actually play a, a repeated pattern. Because someone asked me recently, kind of a, a well-known drummer, I won't mention who it is, but he was asking me about any transcriptions of my parts with the Matheny group. And I said, well, man, I never play the same thing once. You know, that's what Shelley Manson jazz is. Not, you never, never play the same thing once. So other than like a tune like Last Train Home, which is the part, to you know, which is a lot of people are saying, man, how do you do that for six minutes? You know, because you can't even leave out like one sixteenth note. But, you know, it's it's mind over matter but all, everything else i play is always different because you're reacting it you know in real time to what's going on let's talk about love can conquer hate you did this uh, with your wife and the video is now on youtube and we're actually going to post that on on the show right. uh, let's talk about how that came about and how deepak Chopra picked it up in uh, 2019 i was i did a week in russia with this great guitar player roman marishnenko so cut to late 2020, you know, so now we have the COVID thing happening. My wife and this, this singer, Lori Akers, Lori asked my wife to play on one of her songs. And then my wife goes, well, I've got this other song. Why don't you sing on this song? So they kind of swap, okay? Yeah. So then my wife goes, Paul, I'd really like you to put some percussion on. At the same time, Roman wanted me to lay down a track for his new record, The Sixth Sense. So I said, well, I'll go in and I'll play both, you know. So I went in and I played the talking drum and I did some percussion for his thing. And then it, it sounded really good. But like when I listened to it, I went like, 
it sounds weird that the second chorus has now this addition of a talking drum on top of the piano. It doesn't make any sense that it's just this. So I said, Roman, I just played on your cut. Why don't you play on this cut? And my wife at first says, oh, I don't want guitar on it. You know, I said, well, just wait. So he's in Moscow. The first thing he plays, he's like a virtuoso, he's ridiculous. So he plays all his flamenco stuff. And it was like, no, 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 no. So then the second take, I, he cut it down a lot. So then by the th by the third take, I said, Roman, just play, just really simple, just augment what's going on. He did it perfectly, you know? And then we, we mixed it together. And then my daughter actually filmed that thing after the fact and, and, and put it together. And the whole, that song, the, the lyrics... Uh, my wife wrote them, but it comes from this rabbi that, where they're, they're talking about the Tree of Life synagogue massacre in Pittsburgh. And so that's why, you know, the whole thing about love can conquer hate. Uh, I have a friend that knows Deepak, I guess, and Deepak heard it. And then next thing you know, like now it's his artist pick. He, lo he loves the song. Because the one thing, that was like a demo, believe it or not. My wife was trying to get like a Lady Gaga or Jennifer Hudson or somebody like that because it's almost got like gospel roots and she still does for a matter of fact but it was so hard to try to get it past that block you know to get through management or anything like that so if anyone hears that and knows a great singer that would want to re-record that my wife would be totally open to that the fact that Deepak loves it I mean I think that's really going to open up some doors and you're teaching lessons, private lessons? Oh, yeah, I'm a tenured professor now. So I teach, I still teach drum lessons, of course, you know, and which I love doing because I've had some famous students. Prince's last drummer, uh, Hannah uh, Ford Welton, was my student for four years. So she was with Prince in Third Eye, Eye Girl until he died. And, you know, Wilco drummer, Glenn Kochi is one of my one of my former students. And, and then people can find you how? Well, I mean, I've paulwordico.com but I also you know on Facebook you know I've got a couple Facebook pages but you know my email is just paul at paulwordico.com they can email me too you know I mean that's how we kind of it is up, yeah. you know and, well that's the thing you know I don't know if you know this but I was probably one of the first 10 drummers in the world to have a website I think Mike Shree from Santana might have been the first guy but you know in early 90s I started seeing these commercials this a www whatever right and so you know after a couple months i go what the heck is this so i went to like a cop usa and i asked the, the sales guy I go what the hell is this and he goes well it's this thing called the internet and you need like you know you have to somehow put it up there and i said how do you do that he goes well you so i bought like net netscape navigator I was teaching at Northwestern University at that time, so I, I had access to free software, too, and, and programs. So I got BB Edit. So BB Edit, you have to type in all your code. So I remember going in, I started, like, you, you type in some code, then you drag it into Netscape Navigator to see how it looks. Now, if you hit a comma instead of a period, you'd see nothing. So then you'd have to look at your code. But once... I put that up, and I remember my wife was worried about me. I think I kind of went into seclusion for about 48 hours in this in this room, just kind of like that, just coming out to have, you know, have some food. And the next thing I know, you know, I put up my website, and I started, you know, getting emails from Indonesia and France. It, it opened up all these doors that was so fun because, to me, technology – it's really fun. I mean, it really, it's, it's, and it's, it's hard to turn back. I mean, there's some definitely problems with it, like everything, but it's really opened up so many doors. So to be able to teach and access YouTube videos or access, you know, stuff to show your class, it's, it's an amazing thing. In the old days, you had to go to the library and get a book, you know, and right. then check it. Paul, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Bob. Great. A anytime. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan. Seen enough 
to make us change our way. Tape will self-destruct in five seconds.